Good afternoon. It's the 27th of December, 2021, and this is the 79th episode of New Paradigms with Sargas Angari. Obviously, I am not Sargas Angari. I could never fill his shoes, but uh, for the next hour, uh, I will attempt to do as much as I can uh, to honor the NECSE and their mission to be able to educate and inform those about current events around the world. Uh, my name is Al Johnson. I am the Researcher and Senior Advisory Board Member of the NECSE, uh, specifically on Asia and Southeast Asia. And what we'd like to do for the next hour, as I said, is educate people upon a threat that many people hear about, but not a lot of people really understand. Uh, and that threat is the CCP in China. Uh, NECSE has been focused on China and specifically Sargas Sangari has been looking at the threat that China poses to the United States and the free world uh, since at least 2012. Uh, and I've been looking at the threats before that. And so looking at the long durée, uh, we see trends and analysis, not only in what China does, but in how America and our allies interpret that threat. And sometimes the interpretation of America and our allies is even more dangerous than the threat from China, because if you misunderstand the enemy, uh, you will make mistakes in that. Um, some of the news media that's come out today, for example, is showing that Cuba uh, has recently signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative with China. So here, uh, you know, ha hailing back to, you know, the Cold War, uh, when Russia began to move missiles into Cuba and the Kennedy administration had to face the threat of a hostile power with projection of power capability right in our southern doorstep. It's happened again. So over the years, we have not learned much from history. So hopefully what we'll do here is be able to, to bridge that gap a little bit. And if people understand the threat of China, they'll be better able to counter it. So knowing your enemy and a basic understanding of the CCP, CCP is the topic. Uh, and to go into that, we've got a few slides again for today. Uh, and Fred, if you could pull those up right now, we'll take a look at some of those. And the first thing that everybody needs to understand is, is China itself is an artificial construct. And this may seem a bit odd to some people because they, they've heard the usual um, narrative about China. It's a 4,000 year old culture. It's been there for generations. Um, but the reality is, is somewhat less so. Um, and that's what we're going to go into it today is, is that's why you'll see China in parentheses is that the, the construct of China is actually fairly modern and it really developed from a Western perspective. The West was able to mold and shape China. And over the last 70 years, the government of China, the, both the CCP and before that, the Kuomintang nationalists were able to use the Western definition to their advantage. And the CCP has leveraged that um, tenfold in a way that the, the West was never intending to do when they formed this construct of what was known as China. And we'll go forward to the next one. Next slide. So you may be asking yourself, well, why is this even important? Uh, and the main part is, as you can see, and we'll go into it a little bit further as the presentation goes on, a lot of leadership, a lot of commentators, a lot of analysts look at China in this artificial construct. They look at it in, I use the word mystery rather than history, but they are actually victims of propaganda. They're victims of historical misunderstanding. They're victims of what we call misinformation, so to speak. And what they do is they unwillingly or willingly, in some cases, carry the water for China. And by doing that, they are advancing the, the propaganda of China, even, even uh, subconsciously they're doing it, and they're advancing the aims of China. The other thing they do is when they look at this, this false history, they're not able to anticipate what are the next moves of China. Uh, and as everyone that's worked in, in any, type of, uh, any type of intelligence and any type of, uh, of planning group of any type of uh, strategic think tank, you understand, you must understand the reality of your adversary or even your allies. So understanding a correct view of China is absolutely important, being able to understand what are your next moves uh, to counter that which China is doing. And so that's what we're going to look at. And you would be surprised, as we'll point out, there are actually some very, very smart people in the United States um, that are against China, but unwillingly carry the water for them because they have an a, a incorrect view of what China actually is in the history of China. And that's why it's important. So yes, some of the themes that we talk about are 100 years old, maybe 200 years old. Um, however, it has a direct bearing on what happens today, tomorrow, and you know, in the future. So very important. Next slide. And the way I usually preface this is, and this is important for people in the NECSE group to understand, is that the Ottoman Empire, um, a long time ago, you know, 100, 200 years ago, the Ottoman Empire was seen as the Muslim world. Uh, in fact, there were a few writers in the West that saw the Ottoman Empire as the the Muslim world, and that it was the end all be all of everything that was Muslim. And sometimes that would be synonymous with Arabic, even though the Turks were not, and you had, sometimes they would actually count Iran into it, which was Persian. Um, but they had this kind of myth about what the Ottoman Empire was. 
And now through history, and thanks to to more learned individuals learning about the Near East and, and listening to voices from the Near East and listening to all the diversity that was from the Near East and other folks that would, that would look at it, for example, here is T.E. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia, uh, were able to understand that the fragmentation of the Ottoman Empire wasn't one uh, nation, it wasn't speaking with one voice. It was simply an empire in the classical sense, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, like the Russian Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was simply another empire. And it was made up of many disparate groups with many different histories, languages, cultures, and and it wasn't all Muslim. Uh, there were Assyrian Christians within this empire. There were Greek Christians. Uh, there were many different disparate groups, even within Islam, as we now know, there is Shia and Sunni. But 150, 200 years ago, not many would recognize that there were even schisms or differences within even just the Islamic religion. Um, but now we do know that. And however, where is the T.E. Lawrence of today? Where are the voices that are showing the Chinese empire, is, which is essentially the same thing as the Ottoman Empire? It's made up of actually more disparate groups than the Ottoman Empire ever was. There are hundreds of languages. There are multitudinous nations in there. There are so many subgroups within China. That it, it, it's, it's actually the Ottoman Empire almost times, you know, into a second scale, third degree. Um, it have, it have a very diverse group within China. Uh, and we call it China. We don't recognize it as a Chinese empire. It is a Han centric kingdom, essentially, that grouped into a warlord faction known as the Kuomintang, redesigned the image of what a Chinese person was based on the Western idea of what China was. And then overthrew the Manchu empire that was ruling all of China. And then they created their own empire in 1911. And that is the modern China. Um, but we haven't done that. We see China as a 4,000-year-old a history, and we see it as avenging the embarrassments of the past. In fact, you'll hear many politicians, even in the West, say, well, the reason China is doing it, and what they're saying is actually the CCP is doing what they're doing. The reason they're doing it is to make up for 100 years of, of deprivations, of 100 years of embarrassments, of 100 years of shame which is a, a propaganda lie because until 1911, any government before 1911, when the West is talking about it, is the Manchu kingdom that took over all of the smaller sub kingdoms within the continent and that were called the Middle Kingdom, which we incorrectly translated as China. But it was definitely the Han saw it as a foreign occupation. And again, we'll go into this. So next slide. So a reevaluation of how we see China is absolutely important. And it is just like the Ottoman Empire. Like I said, as we know, this was the Ottoman Empire from, from 1699. It, it spanned almost all of the, the Islamic world in the Near East, uh, in North Africa and the Middle East and parts of Europe. However, over time, these subgroups were able to break free of the central Turkish control. And you have the exact same dynamic within China today. There are multitudes of nations that wish to break free from the, the yoke of Beijing's control. And instead of the West kind of facilitating that or being neutral into it and letting them be able to self-determine on their based on their own um, political and geographical and ethnic and, and religious um, densities in their areas. Instead, we actually facilitate China um, locking these people down. For example, uh, the Uyghurs is probably the best known, but only one of many, uh, which is in, in Xinjiang in Central Asia. The Chinese conquered that area. It was never part of the Han Empire. It was never part of the CCP's historical empire because they came out in 49, nor was it part of nationalist China in 1911. And yet we don't look at the history of China the same way we do now with the history of the Near East and the Middle East. And that is something that needs to be done and needs to be addressed uh, correctly. Now, the difficulty in that, of course, is that most institutions that do higher learning have paychecks that are uh, subsidized in part or in large part or in whole <laughs> by the Chinese Communist Party through various means. So it is very difficult to be able to tackle this from an academic viewpoint because the subsidies that come in, they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. Um, and so they tend to toe the party line as far as this kind of fabricated history that goes throughout. The other part is, is that China will simply cut you off from looking at archives, which are in continental China. Um, and a lot of people don't realize you can go to Taipei, Taiwan, get those archives and look at it, which is, of course, a separate country. But even then, Taipei has its own nationalistic bent toward changing the narrative of what China is, making it a longer area so that they claim geographic control of what they really don't have. So it makes it very difficult. So Americans and other Westerners and other people in the free world have to look at China and be um, somewhat brave <laughs> in that you have to 
honestly look at these things and recognize that it's not going to come from academic institutions. It really does need to come from perhaps political science think tanks um, that you know are independent of the Chinese money or independent of Chinese political pressure to be able to do that. And again, the stakes are high because national policy is based upon what we think the Chinese are, what we think they're going to do based on their past performance and their history. Um, next slide. And as I mentioned before, this is an example. So within China in 1911, when people said the word China, when the nationalist Sun Yat-sen created a new nation, he overthrew the Manchuris that had run the dynasty up until that point. Um, that was China in yellow. And that was it. And that was even divided into different groups. Tibet was its own its own country. Xinjiang, Xinjiang was its own country. Mongolia was its own country until the Soviet Union invaded it, made it a puppet state. Um, and Manchuria initially was its own, it retreated back to its own kingdom, its own border areas, because it had ruled all of that in yellow and a little bit of that in blue for, you know, about 250 years. Um, but now they had been kicked out. Um, but this was the map of Asia in 1911. Now it fragmented and, and multiple little ethnic groups began to create their own governments, uh, known incorrectly, I believe, as the warlord period, which is a misnomer. Uh, and that fragmented even further. Uh, and then there was a military campaign by one of those quote unquote lower lords, uh, who is, was a, was Chiang Kai shek. And he kind of unified a lot of the yellow, but not all of the yellow. And then various other factions were still fighting within China. So it looked very much like, uh, you know, the Syrian civil war or any other, you know, breakup. So for example, Bosnia Herzegovina, right? When, when Yugoslavia breaks up, it goes into multiple nations the way that they have, they, I self identify in the way that they historically believe with their group. Uh, and only a, a large amount of force can keep them within their own geopolitical borders. And, and that's really what happened to China. There's actually a number of smaller groups that have their own national identities, histories, and ethnic groupings, uh, which creates a lot of tension. But the U.S. and other nations don't look at that in the right way. There's no T.E. Lawrence looking at this saying, oh, by the way, all of these groups want to to be able, many of these groups want to be able to be free and be autonomous within themselves. And there's another part that we don't talk about a lot, but it does have a big factor in there. There's a lot of big business in the West that has what James Bradley called the China mirage. And this is the lure, the promise that this huge market of China is going to open up and you're going to be a billionaire overnight. So they don't want, for marketing purposes, a fragmented uh, environment. They want like one-stop shopping for their product. They want to talk to one guy at the top. And once that CCP boss endorses his product, it's smooth sailing for a billion customer, potential customers that come through there. If it's 21 different nations, so for example, in Europe, before the EU, it's difficult. You're going to have to do some legwork. So it's not just ideological sometimes or ignorance. It's the power of the purse, the power of the profit. The easy lure of money is what drives a lot of people to try to, you know, keep China as this idea of one gigantic big nation, but it's not. There's a lot of occupied states within China and we need to start addressing it as that. Next slide. So we've already gone over this. Why do we evaluate China differently? One is, of course, ideological. One is financial. And the other is some people are, are lazy. They're intellectually lazy. They say, well, you know, this is what I studied uh, in college. This is what I got my PhD on. So I'm not going to change it. Uh, or these are these are big businesses that say I want one stop shopping for my marketing. I don't want to have to I don't want to have to have fifteen different marketing strategies. I want just one guy that I can leverage in a totalitarian system, and I'm good to go. Um, so there's a lot of different ways and why we evaluate China differently than we would any other empire, such as Austria Hungary or the Ottoman Empire. Um, but this will give you a kind of a little bit of ammunition about how you can look at it and begin to change the narrative. So when you hear someone talk about China in an incorrect way, you'll be able to counter them and go, no, no, this is actually how it is. Um, so next slide. And one of the really good books is uh, by Gregory Lee, and I would highly recommend it. In fact, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> Here's a good example. So a lot, of, a lot of good notes in this one. And you can always tell the books that I like because they'll have a lot of good notes within it. And Gregory Lee wrote this fantastic book about China. It's called China Imagined. And Gregory Lee, is, is he's, he's an ethnic Han, um, but he saw his father, who was an immigrant, who had left China before the nationalists took over. And he watched his father in, and studied him about how he came about identifying over time as Chinese, but he had never identified as Chinese before. And that was due to, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, a massive amount of propaganda. And then the CCP took it up late 1940s and 50s and promoted it not just in the continent, but for what they call the diaspora. <laughs> 
So the people from continental Asia that had used the, the cynic writing, they suddenly became Chinese and it was an evolution. But as Gregory Lee points out, it says that on the contrary, China can be seen as having been created. Its national identity was forged during the 20th century. China was created. And we have to understand this. There was no China before 1911. There was the Central Asia, like Europe, and there was different countries that or different kingdoms that took over that central area. At one time, the Mongols had taken over. At one time, the Manchus had taken over. And we call them Chinese dynasties, but they weren't. It's like saying that Germany is part of a Roman dynasty. It's not. <laughs> it was created far afterward, and Rome was long gone. Uh, and so that's the first myth that needs to be broken is that this is a dynasty. There, dynasty implies that there's continuity of government, continuity of culture, continuity of language, that there is some continuity between transitions in styles of government. In this case, there is none. There's a foreign invader that comes in and pretty much redoes everything. The only thing that's similar is the writing system and some of the social structures. But that's we have that in many other cultures, and yet we don't call those dynasties. So we, that's the first thing we have to realize. Next slide. And of course, Lee goes on to say, at no point until the modern era was there a direct correlation between Zhongwo, which is the middle countries, right? So that's the technical term. And you'll see it in, in the Cynic script for China. It's the middle countries and the West's China. So the West called it China and assigned dynasties to it. And even the, the people that live there, the government that did it, the Manchus, didn't see it as continuity at all. They, ado they adopted some of the previous governments or their previous kingdoms ideas, but they didn't adopt all of them. Uh, and they maintained a separation between the people they had conquered and themselves. Uh, and so that's another thing that we have to understand is that the word China actually comes simply from a geographic area like Europe or Africa or the Middle East or the Near East. Uh, it's not a country. It's a geographical area. And it has been co-opted in the 20th century and especially the 21st century to denote a, a, a a national government or a nation that has existed for 4,000 years in one form or another with different dynasties. And that's just not true. Uh, next slide. Uh, and as he points out again, all the rest is invention, reinvention, anachronistic projection back to a past, a, a modern version of history that serves the present. And it does serve the present. And again, these myths will be very hard to break because they serve a political purpose today. Um, when China makes a claim to, for example, Tibet, when it makes a claim to Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, when it makes a claim to parts of, of Mongolia that it has, when it makes a claim to Manchuria, uh, when it makes a claim to Taiwan, um, what they're doing is they're reaching back into this mythical past and they say that we are inheritors to this. Um, but we would see that we would not accept that, for example, when Hitler, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm the inheritor or Mussolini, I'm the inheritor of the Roman Empire. No, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, he never was. Uh, Xi Jinping is in no way inheritor to anything that happened before 1947. Um, from 1947 onward is what the CCP can claim. From 1947 to 1911 is perhaps what Taiwan, the government that's on Taiwan, if it's Kuomintang, can claim. But before 1911, that's, that's Manchurian. That's a different kingdom that's unfortunately long gone. Um, and so that's what we have to recognize is that these are invented histories that serve a political purpose today to grab land on historical claims that are very tenuous, even of themselves, but become even more so when you understand the real history. And so when we erase that, when we put in the real history, what we see is it, it highlights China, the CCP's naked aggression. Uh, and, and at this point, I need to point out something. Even the word China, when we say the China or the Chinese people, we're really not talking about the Chinese people. There is nothing as the Chinese people. This was invented, as you'll see Gregory Lee goes through with his father and with his other relatives and, and the people around them during the early 20th century. They created this identity because they saw this new thing called China and they wanted to be associated with it in their disparate groups overseas uh, in mostly Western countries. And it made them feel powerful. It made them feel part of a big group. Um, but the China that we look at today is essentially the CCP. It's not a Chinese people. It is the CCP. Uh, in fact, there's no better illustration of that than um, there's a great book by the Hoover Institution when they used to do some really good research about it. And I would highly recommend going to the, the Hoover Institution. And they translated literally um, all of the documents, usually from every year that the Chinese army wrote. And so this is these are all the, the, the books from one year of the politics of the Chinese Red Army. And whereas in the American Army uh, that, that both Sargas and I served in, we would write about readiness levels and, and how how able we were to do our combat mission. Right. How much equipment I had, how much training I had, 
and, and do our combat mission in support of the Constitution, which is a, a contract with the American people and the American government. And that's what we would focus on in the military. But we essentially we were for the American military, we're the U.S. military. Uh, the Red Army is not a Chinese army. It is a political army. It is the Chinese Communist Party's army. So what you will see very quickly in this book uh, all throughout is that they are simply reinforcing politics, that they reinforce the Chinese Communist Party. And if the Chinese people get in the way of that, well, then they are the enemy. Uh, and this was illustrated, of course, you know, wide open in Tiananmen Square um, when the Chinese people said, you know, we don't want this this politics to continue going this way. And suddenly the Chinese people overnight become an enemy. And that's the a lesson of the danger of politicizing a military um, is that, you know, you're not a national army. You're simply a tool of one political party uh, that's used against the people. So when you say the Chinese people, no, you're talking about the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, which has its own army, the Chinese people. They have no army, even though it's called the People's Army. What they write about is not for the people. They're writing about they're serving the party. So keep that in mind when you're when you hear someone saying, I respect the Chinese people. I respect this. Which Chinese person? Which which group are you talking about? You know, Maoists, Hmongs, Mongolians, Manchurians, you know, Uyghurs, you know, which one exactly? Uh, and, you know, is it the people or is it the party? Uh, and you need to you need to really get the person to specify, are you supporting the people and, and the disparate people that are there, have them identify it, and then identify, are you supporting the party, which is the government, which is the official, uh, you know, uh, broadcasting of what we call Chinese um, desires and dreams and, and political machinations. Next slide. Now, uh, again, if there's any further proof, another final book that I would recommend is the, is the Kuomintang, Selected Historical Documents. And this talks about, and this is from, most of these are actually from Sun Yat-sen, the, the George Washington of, of China is what he was called. Um, but he's the one that pretty much led, ideologically led the revolution against the Manchu Empire, or the, the Manchu rulers that were over the Han Chinese and all the other groups at the time. Um, and you'll notice in his writing, he's all about the foreign invader. And who's the foreign invader? It's not Japan. It's not the British. It's not Americans. It's not Portuguese or the other nine Western nations that had taken, you know, parts of the Middle Kingdom. It was the Manchus. The Manchus were the foreign invader as he saw them. And once he overthrew them, once he, once the revolution was successful and the Manchu empire uh, went away and he had to set up a republic, um, he faced a problem is because all of these other disparate nations, these disparate groups that the Manchu had conquered didn't want to be part of a central government. Some of them didn't, some of them did. Um, but the ones that didn't, how do you deal with them? And they eventually came to a, a realization that, well, they would lose most of the geographical area if they allowed all of these, these other groups uh, to have their own nation back. And so the nationalist Chinese began to conquer and began to, to militarily bring them into the fold. And then China divided up and went into a civil war for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And it really didn't end until 1947 when the issue was decided between the nationalists, the Kuomintang and the communists that were supported by the Russians. So um, that's another thing that we need to keep in mind is that this is, again, very new construct. And even the, the so-called Chinese revolutionaries that won 1911 didn't see themselves as Chinese. The people before 1911 that were running China was actually uh, a foreign invader that was occupying China. So when, when a Western person will tell you that there's a hundred years of shame or a hundred years of, of, you know, debasement that the Chinese have gone through, that they're only now, you know, getting revenge for, they're setting the, the ledger straight. It's not true because before 1911, they didn't care because when the West would take away bits of what we call China, they were taking away bits of a Manchu empire, a foreign occupying empire. And they really didn't care. That's why many Chinese armies didn't fight very well um, against those foreigners because they actually saw a joint cause. They thought it was fighting a foreign invader, not fighting a Chinese people. So next slide. And what we already talked about. So again, just realize that that the formation of this idea of China is something in the 20th century that was created based on a Western construct uh, that they use for nationalistic purposes and expansionistic purposes. So next slide. Now, why is this important? Now, this is going to surprise a lot of people, uh, and this may be somewhat somewhat uh, of an eye-opener for people, but it's important. Now, this is actually a, a fairly good book. Uh, it's by Newt Gingrich, who is by no means a friend of China now. Um, Newt Gingrich actually came to the realization that China is the biggest threat against the United States, and rightfully so. And I actually would recommend this book uh, to anybody. It's somewhat dated because it's Trump versus China, and we're now we're now in a new new administration. Um, but in his book, he points out um, a lot of the inherent um, competition 
and struggle between America and the CCP. So again, he uses the term China. I would say the CCP, Trump versus the CCP or America versus the CCP. Um, but he does point out all of the structural problems, the structural frictions and the China's aggressive goals. So the CCP's aggressive goals in their end state and they do want global domination. And he points out, you know, chapter by chapter by chapter, everything that they're doing to that end. Uh, and so he takes the veil off of, off of the CCP, but he makes one, one mistake in this. And the mistake is this, is that he carries the water for the CCP. In other words, he justifies some of their propaganda by saying, well, maybe they're doing this because of the hundred years of shame that they were or at the hands of the Westerners when, you know, it ignores the actual history of the CCP and of what we call China. Um, and so in doing that, he makes a few fundamental mistakes within his book, and it would be a much more powerful book if he would call out those historical inaccuracies. So in other words, rather than carrying water for the CCP and making it difficult and, and creating some sympathies because Americans love an underdog, let's, let's admit it. We love an underdog. We love the, the nation that gets beat up and rises back up again and can fight it, right? The Rocky story of a nation, right? And so that's what China has kind of written into its false history. They're the Rocky nation. Uh, that's that the CCP leaves out the fact that they pretty much stole the revolution from the, from the Kuomintang and they did it with a, with Russian help. And for about 20 years, they were a puppet to the Russians that Mao was pretty much beholden to Stalin as long as Stalin was alive. And only after Stalin's death did Mao start to become a little bit independent. And Kissinger, in fact, was worried about uh, Kissinger and Brezhnev during the Nixon administration was worried that the Soviets would pull what they did in Czechoslovakia with China and, and reel China back in uh, to the Soviet sphere of influence and make China again kind of a puppet state. Uh, and so that's why uh, Kissinger pretty much did his diplomacy and sent Nixon to Beijing to talk to talk to the Chinese and try to divide them up. But the problem is, is that is that Newt Gingrich misses the opportunity to call out the Chinese propaganda. And so in so doing, he allows people to still have some sympathy for the Chinese. He sets them up as an underdog. Uh, and, and we can see this if you want more information uh, that will actually be in the description. There'll be a link in the description for a full breakdown of the book. And then you can really see how knowing the true information, you can then read a political science book and recognize where there's the errors and where there's not and make it an even stronger case for actions against China to counter Chinese expansionism and militarism in the world. Uh, so I would highly recommend the book, but just realize that, and again, there's, there's lots of notes in here. <laughs> so, uh, as you, as you can see, this is a great book, uh, cause I've got lots of notes, but, but the reds are the flaws, the yellows are the okays. Um, but about chapter nine, you're going to see where that knowledge of true history comes into it and, and where Gingrich kind of Unfortunately, he falls into the trap of carrying water for the Chinese. But when you're armed with it, it makes it a much stronger book. And then it makes his, his plans and his recommendations for how to counter China even stronger uh, if you have that information. So this is how this information is able to be used in political science here. Uh, and for more information on all of this, if you want, there's a little barcode at the bottom. You're going to see that little, that little code. Uh, if you hold your phone up to that and, and you take a picture of it, it'll lead you over to the Near East Center for Strategic Engagement. Uh, that, of course, is Sargas and Sargari's. Uh, he's, the, he's the CEO there and has built up an, a, a very, very vibrant organization for being able to do these types of in-depth analysis. Uh, and then not only that, but provide the answers for, you know, OK, well, where do we go from here and what is this knowledge good for? Uh, and so we'll be putting more links there. We'll be putting more deep dives into this. Uh, but again, just follow that link below to the website for the Near East Center for Strategic Engagement for some more information. Uh, we're limited here in what we can present, um, but over there on that website, we're not. So next slide. Uh, and again, one of the big ones that we're facing right now, as you've seen in the in the um, news, probably <laughs> you know more so than last year, is that Taiwan and they say the one China policy with Taiwan, as if it some at some point had been part of China and broke away because of 1947 to 1949, the results of the revolution or the results of the infighting, the civil war between the the Chinese communists and the Chinese nationalists. Uh, but it's not true because Taiwan uh, was actually considered terra nullis, which is it wasn't a country um, when it was uh, actually taken by the Japanese in 1898 during the, the first what they call the Sino-Japanese War. But it was a Manchu Japanese War, if you really look at it. Uh, and it was theirs until 1945. And then it was an occupied zone, much like Okinawa. Uh, and the Kuomintang, the Chinese nationalists with Chiang Kai-shek, that was their occupation zone. So they were administering the occupation of the island of Taiwan. Now, they got kicked off the mainland because the the, the Chinese communists uh, got massive amounts of help from the Russians in Manchuria. 
uh, and who the Russians armed them, the Russians gave them equipment, the Russians gave them advisors, the Russians pretty much lit a fire under Mao Zedong to, to go and do this massive counterattack. At the same time, the U.S. pulled our support for the nationalists. And so the Chinese communists beat the nationalists, the nationalists set up a government in exile on Taiwan, and then established their own government. And then through pretty much diplomatic entropy, uh, Taiwan became a Kuomintang uh, government, but it became its own democratic government. So through this long process over the decades, under all international agreement, all, all international standards, the democratic process has been applied to Taiwan and they vote themselves a democracy. In fact, the Kuomintang government, uh, part, his political party, um, was voted out of the majority recently uh, in favor of a, a much more independent Taiwanese government uh, with, with Prime Minister Ma right now. Um, and so, you know, this is a country, this is its own country. And yet, even to say one China policy is the same as saying back in 1930s, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, <laughs> you know, Ein Führer, uh, you know, Liebenstrom is a thing. It's not, you know, in other words, you're promoting a Chinese propaganda lie that Taiwan was ever part of the CCP, that it ever belongs with the mainland. It is a completely separate island. It is a completely separate nation. It's a completely separate people. There's some refugees there from the mainland that were the, that were the, the nationalist refugees, but there were indigenous Taiwanese that were there. There's a lot of Japanese, ethnic Japanese that remained on the island afterward and they're still there. Um, and so, you know, this, this one China thing is very bad. And, and this manifests itself in U.S. policy. Unfortunately, when we, when we say we support a one China policy, um, and we've, we say, well, Taiwan needs to be part of it. That's that's absolutely historically incorrect. And even under international laws and standards, you take the history out of it. They've self-determined uh, themselves under the self-determination principles ensconced in the UN, by the way, um, that they're an independent nation. Um, and the the John Cena video was, was a great example of how Americans are kind of ignorant about the whole thing and they make themselves look like fools on there. So if we can show that that John Cena video, you know, big, but but not too bright. Uh, we'll play that video right now so you can see just, you know, exactly how far this misinformation permeates itself into the American culture. And former pro wrestler John Cena has touched off an international controversy. Cena apologized to the people of China after calling Taiwan a country during a promotional interview with a Taiwanese broadcaster. Taiwan is a country. I mean, it, it's, it's an independent country. John Cena is not alone in Hollywood in towing that line. <laughs> A late show has acquired the full so, apology. To be very clear, when when John yeah, Cena said that he respects the Chinese China. people and the Chinese, uh, uh, the China and the Chinese people, he's not. What he's saying is, I respect the CCP party because if he understood it, there's no China in Taiwan. Taiwan or Taiwanese, they're separate. They're not. It's not the same. It's a construct. The CCP is who he's kowtowing to. The CCP is the one that he's apologizing to. A, brutal political party that's, you know, essentially you could say it's it's neo-Nazi now because they're very Han-centric and they don't like ethnic minorities and they they have massacred and done genocide against ethnic minorities in the continent. Um, so John Sino literally is the kind of guy that back in the 30s would be apologizing for saying that, oh no, you know, we, you know how dare I say Poland is an independent nation? How dare I say that, you know, Russia is an independent nation, doesn't need to be part of, of Germany? Um, and unfortunately, that's the level of misinformation that goes through that you have a guy that, that should know better because he speaks, you know, he, he's able to speak Mandarin, he's able to speak a little bit of Cantonese, and yet he doesn't know the history of it. He doesn't understand the actual history of it. He's never read the Kuomintang papers. He doesn't understand Sun Yat-sen. He doesn't understand the history of Taiwan. He doesn't understand what was going on. And so that's the danger in not knowing it is that you fall into these traps. And he may not support um, the CCP. But his apology definitely does. Now, he probably did it for economic reasons. Um, but if he did know the truth, it's another question. Would you really, would you have that same apology or would you phrase that apology in that same way? Hopefully not. Hopefully he is a good person inside and he recognize, you know, he may recognize when he sees the truth, if it's presented to him, um, that that was a, a huge mistake that he made on both a logical and a moral, moral scale. So next slide. Uh, and then wrapping up here, as I always say, organizational structure dictates the outcome. So in this uh, case, what you're doing is you're organizing information. You're organizing how you are able to see the world. And when you do that, when you have this right information, you organize it in the right way, you remove the, what I, the Chinese mystery and you replace it with a factual history. And in so doing, you can dispel yourself of the China mirage and come about with actual solutions. Because if you don't, it's very dangerous. Um, so reorganizing your structure and how you see the CCP, which is promoting itself as quote unquote China, 
and how you see the history of it and understanding that this is an Ottoman Empire. This is an Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is a, a renewed German Reich that's trying to, to, you know, move out across the entire world. It will help you make better decisions and evaluate the threats, um, going forward. So that's what I'm talking about. Organizational structure sometimes is in the mind. And that's what we need to do is reorganize how we structurally process this information in our mind so that we can actually see a clear picture with clear eyes uh, and give some some viable solutions that are based in reality and not in fantasy. So next slide. And again, hopefully this was of, of use. Again, if you want more information, uh, there's the, the barcode. You can you can go to the links on the Neary Center for Strategic Engagement. There's also a deeper dive into um, uh, Newt Gingrich's book and a couple of other books dealing with this on the, the History DA website that I, I run on the side, historyda.org. Um, the links will be in the description uh, for the video below. And uh, my my hope is that you would look at these books and that you would educate yourselves more. So go on the NECSE website, uh, do some more deep dives, uh, challenge everything I've said, uh, you know, prove me wrong, <laughs> you know, bring up your information. Um, but at the end of the day, go back to the, the go back into the sources and don't be biased. You know, look at it and how it would be. Compare it to the Ottoman Empire, uh, and then ask yourself the question: Why do we treat China differently than we would treat countries in the Near East, the Ottoman Empire? Uh, and that once we answer that, then you'll definitely see that a, a, a renewal in how we see China, uh, quote unquote, China is long overdue uh, and may have contributed to potentially 70 years of some very bad decisions in Asia. Uh, and that we would hope that the leaders would now uh, you know, begin to find their T.E. Lawrence uh, for Asia, the Asian region, and, and in so doing, um, protect the free world from what the CCP has been doing for the last 70 years. Uh, which is a militaristic expansion that's now reached all the way into Cuba, uh, just minutes away from Florida, uh, and which is a very, very dangerous situation. So we faced this before. Um, we're facing it again. But in 1960s, when when Kennedy had to look at the missiles of October, Americans recognized the threat from Russia and understood what communism was and a little bit better the history of Russia. Um, China, they're falling into a mirage. And, and unfortunately, you can't make some good decisions if you have bad information. So thank you very much. And again, uh, big thanks to the, the magic behind the camera. Uh, you know, uh, Fred there with the, the Cinnamon Productions, we thank you very much. And thanks to Sargas Singari, who has been incredibly busy this last week, not only with the holidays and his family, but preparing for some uh, global engagements, uh, particularly in Africa, uh, that has been eating up a lot of his time. He, he apologizes, but uh, the, the band finally needed some, to, to take a little bit of time to be able to focus on all the many things that he was doing. I thank him for the trust and, and putting me here. And I, yes, I did lose the bet, so I had to wear the suit. Um, hopefully it was, it was useful to you. And thank you very much. Uh, and God bless everyone. And hopefully we'll see you soon safely on the other side.